Hello, cinema cultists. This is Justin Morales, the real king of cinema. I am here remotely with the man behind the mask, C.J. Graham, known for playing Jason Voorhees in uh, Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives, uh, the Hell Cop from the 1991 cult film Highway to Hell, and uh, proud Army veteran. And I just want to say thank you for your service to this country, sir. Hey, it's my pleasure, Justin. Thanks for having me on, buddy. Yeah, thank, thank you. This, this really is an honor. I've been watching these movies. Okay, so I'm 27 now, since I was nine. So we're, we're talking about 18 years. We have, I've been uh, waiting for this moment to, uh, to, to, to meet Jason. Um, the only other people I've met from the franchise have met Corey Feldman at Chiller. I've, I ran into um, Tom Savini at a comic store in Manhattan. Um, so... Yeah, so well, see, uh, Justin, Justin, here's where I get to embarrass you on your show. You weren't even a squirt in your parents' mind when we did this movie 34 years ago, 35 years ago, buddy. Think about yeah. that. Yeah, and uh, you've given me plenty of nightmares, uh, so it's it's quite uh, somewhat intimidating. And is that is that your suit? The, the screen worn suit in the back behind no, you? No, it's not the screen worn. It's reproduction. It's just something wow. in my office. And as you can see over my right shoulder, uh, that's my uh, some military pictures, my uniform military back in the 70s. And then to my left side, you can see uh, Floyd Boy Bunny. I used to be the uh, vice president of casino operations at the Palms in Las Vegas. And I opened up the Floyd Boy Club there and ran the uh, casino operations. Oh, okay. Very nice. Yeah, that you're, still, you're still doing that, the casino thing, right? Actually, I retired three years ago, stepped back oh. and said, hey, it's time to enjoy myself. I, I bought a ranch. I'm in Montana. Oh, okay. That's where uh, you come horses. From. I have bees. I have alpacas. So uh, it's my time just to enjoy myself. I go do some conventions now, Justin. I do some of these YouTubing and some podcasts uh, because my time is much more available. Um, so now I just kind of enjoy myself and try to pass some of that forward. That's, that's great. I'm really happy to hear. Uh, that's a good for you, man. Um, how have you been dealing with, uh, the COVID situation? You know, for, for me, you know, uh, back in, uh, February, actually January of this year, 2020, I finished my last film. I was working on a project with Deborah Voorhees called 13 Fanboy. Corey Feldman was in it. Uh, Kane Hodder, Laura Park Lincoln, uh, D Wallace. You may remember D Wallace. E.T. Uh, uh, so, and then, uh, February, I went to Sweden to do a convention and, uh, the bottom dropped out. So I've been kind of like off the radar like everybody else. I did do one convention in Las Vegas a couple months ago, Days of the Dead. But for the most part, you know, I retired three years ago. I bought a nice ranch. So I've got the horses, the alpacas, like I said. And my day-to-day -day grind is, uh, you know, I got to shovel out the pins with crap for the horses, make sure they're fed and put in the pasture, uh, ride, enjoy myself. So for me, it hasn't been that big of a problem because I don't need to go to work. I don't go to work. I just take care of the ranch. Uh, if I need something in town, I go to town and grab it. Or, you know, sometimes I just order it online and have it delivered. Wow. Uh, you're living the dream. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not even 30 yet and I'm tired. <laughs> you know, you, know so. and you got a ways to go, buddy. But at 60, I decided to cut my ties and say, hey, you know, I'm done. I, I'm going to move on. Uh, running casino resorts as a general manager, a chief operating officer, you know, everything's a number. So I ran a spreadsheet and said, you know what, I can keep working or I can live comfortably and call it a day. And comfortably is just as good as living comfortably. Yeah. So you so you're good with budgeting and stuff. That's good because uh, I, I could use some advice with that. <laughs> yeah. Remember one thing when they say it's free, it's never free. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So, um, yeah, you answered a whole bunch of questions I, I had lined That's up, okay. so I'm kind of at a standstill. Oh, hey, I would just I like to also... Can I, can I tell you about uh, the Friday the 13th part six, how I got the part? Yeah, that was actually the first thing, because you, you had no previous acting experience, no stunt. Uh, you weren't a Hollywood stuntman. Yeah, tell, tell, tell me about how, how that came about. You know, it was uh, luck. Uh, just like a lot of things in life, Justin, luck. 
Uh, I was a pretty good general manager, chief operating officer as a casino executive, but there's always luck involved to get the jobs. And then you got to show what you can do. Uh, I was running a nightclub in Los Angeles. I was a general manager. I had a hypnotist on Thursday nights that brought in a production company to shoot a video so that this hypnotist could put it together uh, and create a promotional video. Well, it just happened the people he brought in are the folks who did all the special effects for part four with Ted White. And they told the hypnotist, hey, why don't you do a skit with uh, CJ? We've got the wardrobe. We'll put him in the wardrobe and uh, you can, he can scare all the subjects on stage. And it went over so perfectly that they kept looking at me saying, you know, we're going to we're going to cast you for part six. I'm, and I just kind of blew it off as, yeah, right. And like I do mean this, Justin, the rest is history, because here we are. You know, this is 1986. We're talking in 2020. And it so happens that Jason Lives turns out to be arguably, usually considered to be one of the, the fan favorites, definitely my favorite from the franchise. Uh, oh, you what, tell what all the Jasons that, Justin. <laughs> yeah, do I, you have a good relationship with the other guys? Uh, Kane yeah, Hodder, I Ted do. White? I see them on a regular basis uh, at a convention. Um, you know, I see each one of them at least once a year, the last three years doing the conventions. Prior to that, maybe every couple of years, I would run into one. Uh, you know, I, I, it's really a great camaraderie between all the people that play Jason's. Uh, you know, Ted White played part four. He's 94 years old now. And Ted is an icon and people don't know, you know, he was standing right there with the Cary Grants and the John Wayne in the days, doubling and doing stunts and everything with them. And everybody just remembers him. He always kind of giggles about it, but He's done over 100 films, he would say, and they remember me for playing Jason. Uh, yeah. You know, in Kane Hodder, you know, he did four. Uh, he's been a great, I mean, just an absolute great ambassador for the movie. He's out there every week hustling. Tom Savini, of course, has been out there for quite a while. And uh, we've lost a couple. Uh, Steve Dash passed away a couple years ago. And about five years ago, we lost Richard Brooker. Richard Brooker. Uh, but the rest of us are still here kicking, and we kind of cross paths and have a good time. Um, I was fortunate uh, about this time last year to do a convention with Alice Cooper and I put the wardrobe on and we did some photo ops together with the fans. So it's kind of a nice camaraderie between the Friday the 13th fans and the series. Uh, there's really a legion of fans out there. It's just numerically, it's just huge. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, it's not even just of a horror genre. Uh, Jason is an icon of, of of an entire, oh, you, the name Jason Voorhees is, is synonymous with the horror genre. And I, you said in the audio commentary, he's more iconic than Tom Cruise, you know, known worldwide, which is um, what, like, that's, that's insane. And considering you weren't even, as a young, young guy, you weren't even looking to become an actor, become a stuntman, and you become part of this legacy. What, 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 what is that like? I just. Well, you know, in today, in retrospect, it's kind of humbling. Um, 30, like I said, 34 years ago, give or take, we did this. And here we are talking three decades later. Um, we didn't know the command that the Jason Voorhees or the hockey mask would command as we went forward, but it is nice to be part of a legacy. And, and, and you know, the universal horror figures back in the 50s and the 60s, the, the mummies and Draculas and Frankensteins. And now we have, you know, we have Freddie, we have Jason, we have Mikey Myers, and of course, Leatherface. And there's a few, you know, add-ons that have come through in the last few years, but those four principles uh, have stood the test of time, which is really humbling to say, wow, you're serious? I mean, they, they may not recognize C.J. Graham as we're talking right now, but as soon as they see the hockey mask, they go, Jason. Um, and, and their whole demeanor changes because everybody has a fantasy about Jason. Nightmares. <laughs> Yeah, um, I saw these movies at too young an age. I uh, I think Evan could uh, agree with me, uh, and so we are the freaks we are now uh, as adults. Uh, but you know, you, you uh, this franchise changed our lives for the better, and uh, we're here now. So, um, now what I wanted to ask you was when you got um, the gig for part six, um, you said you had to. Uh, you you hadn't seen any of the films, so you had to watch part two, part three. Did you end up having to consult uh, the previous Jasons, Steve Dash, Richard Brooker, Ted White? 
Tommy Morgan? No, no, I didn't. I, I really wasn't familiar with who they were except for their presence on, on screen. And Tom McLaughlin, who was the writer director of part six, really wanted to create a new Jason. Uh, Jason was no longer doing to be just a hockey mask. Um, he's going to come back from life like a Frankenstein. He's going to start connecting the dots like he's thinking a little bit. Um, he's going to be much more forceful and powerful in the sense that you really don't see a human as much as you see this mechanical, powerful image like Frankenstein from the Universal movies. So, you know, everything was a little different, but I did take a look to see what Ted White looked like and how they made their presentation. But Tom McLaughlin was quite clear what he was looking for. And, you know, the nice thing apart about part six is um, the opening has got the James Bond opening. I tell everybody that, you know, comes back to life like Frankenstein. How cool is that, right? Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Alice Cooper does the music, and I get to wear a Batman utility belt. So go figure. <laughs> right, that's right. Um, um, and I don't know if you play video games, but in uh, two Mortal Kombat games ago, Jason was a playable character, and one of his special moves uh, when he has a chain around his neck is if he falls, lightning strikes him and he gets back up. Um, so that was... Uh, wasn't wasn't sure if you were you aware of this or yeah that you know the video games have, have really the thing that's really kind of just kind of pyramided is not just the friday the 13th but the video games and the proximity to the reality the reality of how they're done um and then you get to pick the different weapons and stuff and part six just happens to have a lot of weapons from the movie so it becomes a fan favorite um and you know part six you think about it there's only a couple swearing words and there's no nudity yeah. Um, so it's a little different than the rest of the series. Um, gives you an opportunity where a younger person can still look at it. But I do kill 18 people, so I will let you know that. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not ready to show my seven year old sister you ripping the dude's arm off with the machete. Yeah, oh, I, I don't. <laughs> well, you know what? I'll tell you right now. I've had seven year olds come up to me and get autographs, and seven year olds, and I'm not exaggerating, wearing hockey masks, come up to me and get autographs. So I am a little like, really? Um, but they say with their mother or father with them, they've been watching them since they can remember and they just love Jason Voorhees. So, you know, the good thing is, I think they honestly know the difference between right and wrong. And it's more just an entertainment feature and they think it's cool. Absolutely. You know, I think from a young age, you know, I was three years old. I didn't aspire to be the Wicked Witch of the West. You know what I mean? Um, and part of me does think that, you know, I don't think children should be desensitized to violence, but I do believe that they should, you know, face their fears, um, learn to face their fears, uh, as early as possible. Um, I'm not sure I would raise my kids and show them Friday the 13th when they're four or five years old, but you know, uh, different strokes for different folks. Uh, <laughs> it is, it's kind of unique. Uh, Justin, here's the cool part, though, and I mean this, I, I can tell you right now, this year, for sure, a young uh, man that came up to me was seven years old, had his hockey mask on and wanted his autograph. But I also have people 70 years old come up to me and get the autograph. So it is multi-generational uh, in multi-generations of families. I've had a family come up to me, and there were three of them in the family, and they all were dressed as Jasons in different films. Um, all, of, all three of them. And we're talking small one all the way up to a full adult. It was kind of neat. Yeah, wow. Yeah, the, every every movie had a different variation of the mask too. So that, that could work out really well. Like for example, your mask did not have the, the two triangles uh, on the cheeks. Correct, it, was... it did not. Um, and so people recognize that mask uh, familiarized with part six and then part seven, it's the same mask, but the corners chewed out from the, mm. from the blade uh, of the boat propeller from the end of part six. So six and seven are of the same, which you see in six, and they do have their notoriety. And then going back, they started to change it moderately uh, to where we at today. But, you know, it's interesting, uh, Justin, you think about it, you know, in the old days, my days, in other words, nobody wanted to wear a mask. Hey, I want them to see my face. You know, I'm an actor, an actress. I, and you know what, here we are in today's most profitable movies, Correct me if I'm wrong, but everybody's wearing a mask. That's true. Batman, Flash, you know, Arrow. Yeah. <laughs> Should I go on? 
They're all wearing yeah. masks. And it is a very popular thing now to be cool and have a mask on. Yeah. Or having your face enhanced with CGI, like the Incredible Hulk, you know. It's obviously it interesting. Yeah. So I think yeah. we've come full circles where wearing a mask uh, or concealing your identity is considered hip. It's cool. It's like, wow, that's so cool. I mean, if you think about it, all the way to Aquaman. Yeah. That's very true. That's very true. Um, but speaking about the mask, obviously it was not just a mask you had to wear. You had to wear uh, a hood, probably multiple prosthetics. What was that process like? Was it grueling? You know, the first few uh, days of shooting, because you got to remember, you shoot back and forth all over the place. You don't shoot from the beginning to the end. You could start with the end. Um, there were some scenes where we had to do, use different prosthetics, but once we got to where those really hardcore prosthetics were off without the hockey mask, it, it simplified the whole process. I mean, two hours I was on set, and even though it was kind of grueling laying around in that stuff all night long, because um, it's hot, but at the same time, it wasn't as complicated as Hellcop. Now, Hellcop, that was a five-hour process every single day that I shot, sitting in a chair watching MTV and falling asleep because I would start my day at 3 a.m. to be ready for that call first thing in the morning. Yeah. And that was, uh, you were dealing with the Arizona heat, right? Yeah, Lake Powell, to be exact. So it was pretty nice. And, you know, a lot of people aren't aware of the highway to hell because unfortunately, Hemdale, that uh, was in charge of the movie production, as far as putting it out, they bankruptcy and all their films went to the shelves, all of them. Um, I still have about 10 of the original uh, posters that were supposed to be distributed to the theaters. Um, but unfortunately, everything sat on the shelves until a few years ago when United Artists, MGM, bought the library. And I think it's out on a Blu-ray now. I've seen a couple of them come to shows. And people, are, when they find out I'm a Hellcop, they go, oh my gosh, I didn't know you were a Hellcop. Hellcop's a pretty good film. It's got Chad Lowe, Rob Lowe's younger brother, Christy Swanson, Christy Swanson. Buffy the Vampire. Um, not to mention, uh, you heard of a guy named Ben Stiller? Oh, um, I think I saw a, a movie or two from yeah, him. Yeah, you know, he's got about six seconds in it. No exaggeration. His mother, his father <laughs> are in it. Uh, so, you know, what can I say? You know, I mean, he's six, seven seconds maybe in total. And what's the guy at 20 million a movie now? Yeah, I, that was one of his first movies, although his parents were already uh, established names. Yeah, and, I, and, uh, and again, and they, they were in it also, you know, um, and I believe his sister was in it. Don't quote me on that. I have to go back and look at the credits, but I think his sister was also in it at the poker table. Okay. Yeah, and uh, of course, there's a cameo from Lita Ford um, from The Runaways, and uh, oh, yeah. she's uh, rock and roll royalty. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, I was going to ask you, it's kind of, it's, it's has, it has its cult following, but it definitely kind of is definitely much more obscure than a movie like Friday the 13th. Uh, that's very unfortunate that it's sort of kind of. Well, you may not know this, but the, there's a gentleman that played the caretaker taking the boat across the water and he's got his eyes sewn shut and he's about six, eight, seven foot. He just happens, he did pass away, unfortunately, a few years back, but he happened to be the original Predator in the original Predator movie. Oh, I know who you're talking about. I, so, the, the name, it, it's Evan, who's the original Predator? Oh, I forgot his name. Okay, because he was, he was in Highway to Hell as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but I, we, we know who you're talking about. Wow, I did not know that. And I believe he yeah, passed away mm, half a dozen years ago or so. Oh, I'm sorry to hear. Um, yeah, how did, how did she end up being involved with that film? What was what, what was the process like? That was a little different. Um, I went out for the part and Kane Hodder went out for the part. I got the part because I have a little more of a round face for the prosthetics than Kane did. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden, boom, I'm, I'm in these prosthetics. Uh, gentleman Steve Johnson who you may have heard of. He's very well known. He's like, a, he's like a Tom Savini, if you look him up, same concept. Anyway, Steve Johnson has all of his own companies, has done dozens and dozens of films. Uh, he did all the prosthetics. It was one of his first films back in early 90, uh, as he was growing into who he has become as a special effects makeup artist. Yeah, I didn't realize he was involved in that, wow. 
yeah, just yeah, it's there's a, there's a lot behind a movie that's you know kind of not you know that's you know somewhat obscure, but you know I I we enjoy it. we enjoy the movie. Uh, my friends and I we we've watched it before together. We get a kick out of it. Um, I didn't realize that was Jason playing the uh, the the demonic cop though. That was uh, <laughs> kind of well, discovered that. I think if you take and put them side by side and look at the physical structure, you'll go, "Yep, that's CJ." I could see that. How tall are you, CJ? You're six. Uh... Well, I'm, I'm six four when I wake up and six three when I go to bed. So you know, give or take six three and some change, two fifty. Okay, so you're not the tallest, Jason. Ken Kurtzinger is right. No, actually, Ken is the tallest, Jason. Yeah. I think I'm next to Ken. Ken is six six. Um, and I didn't know this till a few years ago. He told me when he did Freddy versus Jason that they put a two inch platform on him to make him six eight. And I had no idea. I mean, he's already a big man, six six. So he yeah. was six eight when he did the movie. Jesus. Yeah, Jason grew. I think Steve Dash was only five ten, five eleven. Uh, oh yeah, he's a normal sized person. So is Ari. <laughs> You know, and, and Richard was a little taller, but very slim, very muscular. Uh, yeah. Ted is my size, 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, uh, he may not be quite as thick as me, but, and then of course, part five, however you want to look at that. And then six, Kane and I are similar size. I might I might have an inch on Kane. Um, I think I'm a little bigger than him too. I think Kane is around 230. I'm 250, so I might be just a little thicker. Yeah, okay. And um, Kane Hodder took over for you for, um, Part seven, the new blood was uh, where he, um, did he consult you at all regarding the passing of the torch or no? Um, well, you know, Kane will tell you the same thing. I was slotted to do part seven. Paramount said, let's use CJ. Uh, John came in to do the directing and, and Kane is a huge horror fan, huge. So, you know, he had to talk to John, the director, to see if John can get Paramount to make the change, which prior to shooting, prior to anything that was done, but Kane. You know, he's a huge horror fan. And I said earlier, he's been a great ambassador for the Friday the 13th series. When I say Kane is out there every week, he's out there doing something every week. Maybe not in 2020, but that man breathes Friday the 13th and all the other films and uh, stunt coordinating and stunts that he's done in his career that, you know, I think he's been a very good ambassador for the series to continue to promote it worldwide. Of course, nowadays he's busy doing. He was in the 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 new Friday the Thirteenth game, and of course he's uh, Victor Crowley in the Hatchet films, right? Um, directed the by Adam Green. Yeah, Derek Mears, who did the last one, Friday the Thirteenth. Jason, great guy. Uh, Derek got married a couple years ago, and uh, he's done a lot of different films on top of it. But you know, Something. he's a great guy too. So Derek is another one out there that, you know, uh, he just lining up for the next one. He was originally, I believe, slotted to do the next one after 2009. And then there became some uh, challenges between the owners and the rights. And it's kind of been on hiatus ever since. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've heard of that. And there was, um, I wonder if it has to do with anything between Paramount owning the first eight movies and then New Line kind of taken. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of, it sounds very complicated and it is, I mean, you know, it's it's really the two people that started it, uh, Mr. Miller and Mr. Cunningham. And they both have certain rights to the writing and the film and the concept. And over years, things change and expire and they're debated on who owns what now as far as who owns 100%. Um, and until that is, uh, you know, truly, you know, signed, sealed and delivered in court, uh, you know, it'll just kind of sit like this. But I hope they come to terms or decide for the fans sake because Justin you got to remember the fans are what put us here if the fans didn't like the movie then Mr. Miller and Mr. Cunningham wouldn't have an argument That's true. they they couldn't wait to unload the film if it was worthless but now that it's worth something there is a difference of opinion but let's don't forget the fans the most important thing that's made this what it is not just the actors the actresses the production people and the writers and directors but the fans yeah. absolutely you know fortunately we were still able to get that awesome new blu-ray box set this year from uh shout factory which yeah, of course includes uh, yeah i would hope that they gave you one for, for free right i gotta be honest one showed up at my door i have no idea where it came from it was mailed <laughs> to me the whole thing all the way through and uh i i really truly truly have no idea why i got it i i, I 
they must have went in the archives and mailed all of the actors and actresses and Jasons and everybody won uh, promotionally, but I got one. So I'm like, thanks. Yeah, I would, I would hope you, you'd get it. Um, yeah, of course, and it includes the new audio commentary that you did with, um, it was a reunion with a bunch of your uh, former cast members. Right. Including, including uh, Tommy Jarvis, Tom Matthews. Now, and to, you know, Tom Matthews, I, I see him once or twice a year uh, now since I'm doing shows. And he's, you know, had a great career along his way. I see Tom Finley periodically, Tom Savini on a regular basis, um, and all the other Jasons. So it's been nice because the camaraderie of everybody, uh, Darcy and the whole team, um, again, I couldn't imagine this 35 years ago when we were shooting a movie that three decades later, we still have this conversation. So again, very humbling experience. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's great. Um, and again, um, that's, that's, that's awesome that you sort of fell into this legacy kind of, but uh, again, it was a, it was by chance. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I can't imagine what, what that, what that must be like. And, um, you know, um, what else did I want to do? Oh yeah. What's your favorite kill? from Friday the 13th part six? My favorite kill is the sheriff. I bend him over and break his back. And the reason for that, Justin, is because there's no blood, there's no guts. It's pure, pure power. If you can imagine taking somebody's arm and turning it backwards like a turkey or their back and popping it down to their ankles, I mean, that's pretty gruesome and powerful. Yeah. And I, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a really complicated effect the way that was done, right? It was almost actually, like it was very um, simple. It's two people. Number one, they dug a hole in the ground. One person is actually standing in the ground, leaning over on the top with their waist up. And the other person is the bottom part of it. So you think that when they bend back, they're just rolling back on the other person. So basically you look like a horse, a front and a back and the two bodies in the middle. How simple is that? That must have been pretty funny, though, to, to see on set. Well, it is. It's uh, a hole yeah. in the ground. I'm standing it up to my waist, and the other guy is head down to the ground by my feet, and they pull the two together, and they just attach the clothing, and one person just bends backwards on the other person, and they do the special effects and sound. Bang. Broken. Oh, well, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely effective. I kind of wince right. every time I see it. That's uh, That was, uh, what's his name, David Kagan, right? Yeah, it was, you know, and he enjoyed it. It was fun. I mean, he did a great job. Again, another great career, uh, still going strong, actually. But that's the nice thing about this. A lot of these folks that you see in it, I mean, if you go back and look at some of the original horror movies, you're going to see a lot of people that are seven-digit actors right now, meaning millions every time they get up on stage. Uh, you know, Kevin Bacon, you start looking, and you start looking at these people going, really? You know, I mean, all these people that have, that have been in these films, uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, you killed Tony uh, Tony Goldwyn. And think about it. He's part of the MGM family, and I'm going yeah, to kill some guy. And I'm like, I was about oh, to say, do I you realize that you... With him. Yeah, you, you, know, you I mean, killed Not because uh, I want money. I want a job. And I didn't yeah. even know who he was. Just a young man doing a movie. And, you know, he's not only is he successful as an actor and a producer, uh, but, you know, he's part of the MGM family at the end of the day. And he's about 58, 59 now. Uh but he's had a great career. I mean, he had a great movie with uh, Tom Cruise. Uh, you know, I mean, he's done a lot of things. Yeah, and he's, uh, I know him from uh, growing up, the voice of Disney's Tarzan. Um, yeah, and like yeah. I said, when the, the Tom Cruise did the film, you know, uh, Samurai, uh, you know, I mean, the captain with the, the mustache that curled up that kept trying to get Tom out of the picture was Tony. You know, so I see him on a regular basis and stuff and I go and I do look and I go, I know that person. And it's, it's again, pleasantly pleasing to say how they've been. In, they've been so successful with their acting or actress career. Me, I did it. I had fun with it. I said, hey, this is great. I did a few commercials, uh, Colgate, Gatorade, AT&T, uh, you know, Miller Beer. And uh, I just took all my money and ran back to Vegas and didn't gamble it. Went back in the casino industry and uh, went through the ranks till I was finally running the casinos as the number one executive. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Sin City. You were, had that in a, in an iron fist. <laughs> Is it anything well, like the movie casino? You know, I, 
Running casinos, I can I could probably be a great person of those. You never know. I live in Montana. They shoot a movie up here called uh, uh, Yellowstone with Paramount Studios, and it's uh, shot about 100 miles from me, give or take. And they should have just finished shooting for next season, but you never know. I mean, if they ever need a casino executive in that or a big-ass cowboy like me, uh, you know, it's not that far away, even if it's just a fun shot. Uh, the nice thing about running casinos is it really – teaches you a lot uh, when it comes to the industry of not just gaming, but business. And, you know, when you have approximately give or take 2,500 employees and you're running a billion dollar resort, um, yeah, my, I remember my payroll was almost a hundred million dollars a year. So you really start looking at numbers and running things, but you can't run a business by just a number. There are people that are working for you and you got to make sure you take care of the people so they take care of you. And that's that's a true thing to always remember. That's a, that's good uh, business. You can find a compromise between both. I can find the number you want in the bank and I can still take care of the team and make sure their 401k and their hourly wages are meeting good standards. That's great. Yeah. Uh, and you, yeah, you've been in, in the casino business for, uh, you were doing this even before Friday the 13th, right? Actually I was, I started in about 1981 as a security guard up at Harvey's Resort, Lake Tahoe. And then I went through and went to dealing school, became a dealer, went down to Reno. I actually wore a pink shirt in uh, Circus Circus at Reno and dealt cards and blackjack, dealt roulette, dealt the uh, crap tables. And then I just went through, and then I left and went to LA. And then I did my LA stint for about six years uh, and running nightclubs down there. Um, I also ran a nightclub for Jackie Collins, Joan yeah. Collins' sister. And her husband, Oscar Lerman, it was called the original Tramp of London. It was in the Beverly Center in Beverly Hills. Members only. Members, you had to be approved by Mr. Lerman. Uh, Stallone was a member. He'd come into table five. He always drank Cristal. Prince came in. He'd go to the nightclub. He'd sit on table 43, red wine. Tom Jones would come to the bar with his son. Uh, you know, so it was always a very, you know, elegant group of folks coming. And I had the pleasure of being the general manager of this club. So I got to meet a lot of nice people. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I would, I ran clubs. I did my acting, my stunt work. I did those commercials. And then I said, you know, okay, great. And I, I, I went ahead and headed over to Las Vegas and went back to work in the casinos. Huh. Very nice. And it sounds like it was something you, you genuinely enjoyed doing. You know, I think that's really important for anyone uh, in, in, in life, you know, and that's what I'm saying. As an executive, you know, running casinos, nightclubs, whatever, you always just have to make sure you do your best. Some of it's luck, like I said earlier, because everybody has some luck. But then once you get the job, you got to prove yourself. You really got to step up to the plate. You got to do a grand slam. There's no triples. There's no doubles. You either go for the fence or you get out of the way and get, get somebody that job that knows what they're doing. I feel you on that. Um, next thing I wanted to ask you, um, kind of going back to Friday the Thirteenth. Now, you were also you also reprised your role as Jason in the Alice Cooper video for uh, uh, "He's Back, Man Behind the Mask." Uh, how long after production on um, Friday the Thirteenth was that? We did that within a few months because the uh, film was coming out, and of course, uh, Alice Cooper wanted to make sure his video was out, so it was all at the same time in proximity. So, and Alice Cooper, you know, I mean, he is just a gentleman, you know, today he's still rocking it down, Hall of Famer, uh, just as humble as pie as a man, his wife is wonderful, and I'll tell you, he's just a good man all around. Yeah, and uh, the reunion with him uh, at, at that convention re uh, recently, that was, uh, that was cool. Yeah, we did the photo ops with the fans, we've done them a couple times now, maybe two or three times we've done photo ops in the last three years, maybe last four years uh, with the fans. And I put the wardrobe on, Alice Cooper comes out and we put the fan between us and we got some great photos. That's awesome. Now in the video, uh, Jason swings to the movie screen, takes off the mask to reveal Alice Cooper. Were you the one who did the, the, the swing? Now Jason, Jason in, this, in this chair don't swing. <laughs> so <laughs> that was just an odd thing that, you know, they wanted to make things different. And I think the most important thing is that you know, Alice Cooper did the music, Man Behind the Mask, and he's back. And he put those together reasonably quick uh, for the film. And 
they are people know that you know he's back and they know it goes with friday the 13th part six so again um you know that's what part six stands out for it's a little different than the rest of the series again you know if you have the the luck of somebody like alice cooper doing the music you already got a hit because you already got a rock and roll hall of famer doing your music yeah and you, you were the one you were the jason that got the theme song exactly yeah. <laughs> so I mean, when you think about it, so I mean, I'm fortunate. I, again, very, very lucky. And uh, who knew? You know, here we are, three decades later, talking. Yeah. Um, I won't hold you much longer. Um, just a couple more questions. Um, so I saw um on IMDb, and I I watched the, just I I kind of skimmed through it. Um, I didn't really have too much time this week. Uh, you were you played Jason's father Elias in a fan film called uh, Friday the Thirteenth Vengeance. Mm -hmm. um and uh some uh some other uh people involved with this franchise including uh director tom mclaughlin i believe uh the late steve dash uh appeared in it what 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 was that like well we did that a little over a year ago and uh it came out recently about in the last few months it's really come out full circle um we shot that yeah vengeance is the name and i played jason Voorhees father elias Voorhees. Uh, a, a gentleman named uh, Jason Brooks played Jason. So I played opposite of him. First time that Elias has ever been seen on screen in comic books and in screens. People have talked about Jason's father, but never a visual. So I grew a beard for four months and they put stringy hair on me. And, you know, it's really a good look, to be quite honest. Um, it's been very successful. They've asked me if I would entertain doing Bloodlines next year, uh, which mean I would resurrect that role. Um, I'd like to look at it, see if it's got merit. Um, I'm not opposed to it, but until I get to look at a script and confirm that I want to participate, I'm hoping that it really has a lot more of a substance. The, this one, Jason's father, Elias, had some pretty good scenes in it, actually very quite a few. And I, I got a feeling that Bloodlines is going to be split between Jason and his father uh, at Camp Crystal Lake, whacking people. Wow. Yeah, and um, I know Tom uh, Tom McLaughlin wanted to introduce Elias in uh, Jason Lives, but that got, ended up kind of uh, getting the can. Correct, and and Tom McLaughlin was in Vengeance. He played the uh, grave caretaker, and uh, you know Tom has written a new script for Friday the Thirteenth, which would be connected on to Part Six in how we would look at Part Seven coming in. Um, he does know Mr. Cunningham, Mr. Miller, and everybody involved, but it's still a complicated issue to get it. But I. I know he's written a script. I know he's been on podcasts talking about it over the last year. Um, so there might be some opportunity for a resurrection of uh, part six into what would have been part seven. And who knows, Elias Voorhees might be in that. I, I have not seen the script. Okay, but it's definitely, uh, but Tom's project, you would definitely would like to take part in that. I would well, love Tom to has see asked me United. already and, and mentioned it on podcast that he'd like to see if I'd be interested in playing and resurrecting because Tom McLaughlin has seen me at the conventions and knows that when I put the wardrobe on, it's the same physical structure. I think I'm seven pounds heavier. I don't think that's enough to show a difference. Um, so he's expressed an interest. We both are the same way though. I mean, two things, number one, I'm older. Uh, do I have the physicality to do it? You know, um, I can't be jumping through walls and stuff as easily as I did, you know, 35 years ago. Uh, secondarily, to be fair, I want to make sure that the script is reasonable. I'm not an expert, but part six was really good. And I feel I was fortunate enough to do a good job. I don't want to resurrect something now and my performance be poor, Justin. I want you to say, oh, God, he shouldn't have come out of retirement. He really sucks. I don't want that. So if I can't give you a product good or better than part six, I wouldn't do it. I really wouldn't. I do it only if I could deliver a product as good or better. That's more important to me because, you know, my integrity and my honor of the performance I did in part six to do part 13 would be an honor. But if I couldn't deliver a product, I, I wouldn't want to put the fans through that. Well, we appreciate, we appreciate the, the quality control on, on, uh, on, on your uh, behalf um, and respect for the fan base. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I would, I would watch that in a heartbeat. I, I, I would, um, you know, uh, you know, I thought, you know, you were a great Jason. Tom is a great director, uh, writer. And he was, wasn't he the alien in um, Disney's The Black Hole? 
Yeah, Tom has done a lot of stuff. Tom's, uh, he's a, a, a professor right now teaching school down in uh, LA. He's a band. He's had a band since the 1960s called The Sloths. Uh, you should check him out. Uh, you can see him on YouTube and stuff, The Sloths. Uh, him and his band back in the late 60s to open for the doors in a few of the bands at the Whiskey Go-Go. And then he decided a few years back he wanted to get back the band together, so to speak. So he's rocking and jamming in a band now. Plus, he's Very doing cool. the, the writing, the directing, uh, and he's playing with a little bit of this and that. So Tom's a very, very talented man. Yeah, very cool. I'd, I'd love to have him on the show sometime. Uh, I'll probably uh, see the best way to contact him. Uh, you know, uh, I definitely would like to pick his brain, especially with the way – he sort of brought Friday the 13th in a completely different direction with the one film. And uh, it's unlike any other film in the franchise. Um, no, he, you know, and you know what? He's a good guy. I mean, I just, um, we did a, a podcast with three or four of us from part six, maybe a month ago. And again, humble as pie, just as polite as can be excited to see people around him, success and successes, uh, you know, it's just going to be a pleasure if he gets the opportunity to shoot and direct it. Um, if I get to work with him, um, you know, if I if I was fortunate enough to do it, um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of football tape on my knees and my ankles like I was in high school. Because, <laughs> listen, when you get older, I, when I was young, I could tuck and roll, Justin, like you. I'm sure you can tuck and roll when you hit the ground. When you get old, you go thump. <laughs> it's just bump. Yeah, <laughs> and I've, you kind of uh, lay there going, uh, "Am I? Is it? Is my foot still working? Is my head?" Uh, but in the young days, you can tuck and roll because your body responds more quicker. When you get older, it's like, uh, "This is gonna hurt." <laughs> yeah, I was I was athletic in high school, and then um, the uh, freshman fifteen in college kind of just never went away. Um, <laughs> well, about three years ago, my horse put me into the fence, slow motion, all the way to the ground. And at that time, I realized I don't know how to tuck and roll anymore. And I went thump. And uh, <laughs> I'd have to think about that one a lot, to be quite honest. Oh, Jesus Christ. Wow. Well, thank God you're okay with it. Jesus. You know, that's a very large animal. Uh, people yeah, have gotten my, I've got injured. a pink, blue eyes, black and white. He's about 1,100 pounds. And then my Palomino, she's about 1,000 pounds. She's real tan. And uh, my wife has a beautiful horse, a red one named Lady, and she's about a thousand pounds too. So they're beautiful animals. They're they're yeah, very absolutely. majestic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I love horses. I do. I do. And I was just watching. Uh, they just remade Black Beauty for like the hundredth time on uh, Disney cool. Plus. I had to watch that for work. So uh, uh, yeah, I like horses. <laughs> so um, last question. Um, what does the future hold for C.J. Graham, um, apart from what we've already talked about regarding uh, um, projects, uh, fan films? Uh, what What do you have um, um, in uh, your your retired life? Um, are you just going to live off the fat of the land for a while, or are there any big plans that uh, we should look out for? Well, now that I can do what I want in a good sense, you know, I've been looking at opportunities. I do have a Screen Actors Guild card. Uh, you know, like I said earlier this year, I did 13 Fanboy. You get a chance to look it up. It hasn't come out yet, uh, but it's got a lot of great people in it. Uh, and then there's a couple that I've, I've signed agreements to entertain for next year that were supposed to be this year. So we're not in a position to talk about them because you do a, a non-disclosure. But now that it isn't about how much money I'm going to make. It's about, is it a fun part, a good part, a successful part? I can look at it more, you know, where I'm not worried about the rent or the, the electricity being on. So I can really have fun with it. And when I did Jason, I had fun with it. And look at the successes it's brought me today. So with that, listen, I'm 63, Justin. I'm almost 64 in a couple months. Uh, I tell people, you can laugh all you want, but I'm in the last 10% of my life, to be fair. Think about it, most people are around 70 uh, So at 63, that's 90% of my life. So I'm enjoying what I can now. Uh, you know, don't take it wrong. Doesn't mean I'm gonna die tomorrow, but you start looking at things a little more realistically um, and think, well, you know, priorities haven't really shifted, but priorities have relaxed, you know? So I've become a little more relaxed. I'm not running a casino, not worrying about if I'm losing a million dollars today or a half a million dollars 
or if I'm winning 2 million, you know, so I'm, I don't have to worry about the responsibilities of 2,500 employees and their families to make sure that they're taking care of their families, um, negotiating contracts and stuff all the time. So for me now, it's really, I get up, I feed the horses about 7.30 in the morning. They're happy to see me. They start prouncing around in their pins and uh, I, I give them an hour and a half to eat and I put them out in the field, let them run around for the day. Uh, you know, tonight, you know, there's a, a doe in the backyard with a nine point buck. You know, when I went to feed the horses, I came out of the barn and there they were standing 20 feet from me looking at me. And I'm like, okay, now this is really majestic, you know, good size buck, nine points and a doe standing right next to them. They're just looking at me. So I was like, okay, don't go too crazy because those horns are going to hurt. So I just kind of walked smoothly to the left and went back to the house. But those are my days. Tomorrow, I'll get up. I'll do my thing. I'll go to the gym. You know, I'm working on a couple projects around the house. Of course, it's a ranch. I got fencing to do. And, you know, like anybody else, I get up and, uh, you know, one foot down, one foot down and head to the bathroom. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, you definitely have a great outlook on, uh, you know, um, I didn't even know you were 63. I, I, I honestly didn't think you looked older than 45. Um, All right, don't be stuck know, enough to me because I said I'd no. do this interview for you. <laughs> no, but, no, no, I, I mean, I mean it. I'm, I'm yeah, really, you, it. You know what, I mean, Justin, you think about it. I mean, you know, I, I, I worked hard to get here, Justin, and I can really tell people that. Uh, my dad died in 1960 when I was three years old, so I've never had a father. I went in the military in the early 70s, Vietnam era. Um, and when I got in the military, I was a sergeant, um, you know, as you can see by my uniform back here. And that taught me some integrity, honor. Uh, and from that point, I just took it and ran with it. So I've always, I've always hit things head on and did the best of my capabilities and then some. And there's no excuses for anybody. I mean, physically, thank goodness I'm healthy, you know, and that doesn't happen to everybody but nobody gave me anything. I just worked hard and I took chances and I was lucky. I always say that because there is some luck involved in any skill set. Well, you know, I would like to, again, thank you for your service to this country and to your contributions, not only to the horror genre, but to cinema uh, in general. Um, it was an honor to speak with you, uh, CJ. Um, and I hope, and I hope you have a, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, whatever. Happy holidays. I always say happy everything. You know, happy Halloween, happy yeah. Va Valentine's Day. I put it all in one circle. Yeah. Happy every day. Okay, buddy? Yeah. Okay. Have a good all night. Right. Nice to talk to you. Take care, okay? Absolutely. Thank you, too. Right, Thank bye -bye. you. All right. Bye.